Greetings students and welcome to my video on deriving Stirling's formula using the definition of the gamma function. In this lesson I'm going to actually start by showing you the Laplace method, which is necessary if we're going to derive the Stirling formula using the gamma function definition. I won't prove Laplace's method but I'll give you an idea of how it works. Suppose I have a function f of x with a unique global maximum at x0. So at x0 the function f of x takes on its highest possible value. There's no other value of f of x that's greater. That's what I mean by global maximum. Another way of saying this is that f of x0 is greater than f of x for all x aside from x0. Let's examine the behavior of f of x around the global maximum x0. To do this we'll perform a Taylor expansion of f of x around x0. We'll continue the expansion until the quadratic term. Now since x0 is a global maximum, the first derivative of f of x at x0 is 0, and the second derivative is negative because the function must be concave down at a maximum. So what we'll do is we'll cancel the first derivative and put a negative sign and absolute value in front of the second derivative. Now we'll compute the integral from a to b of the exponential of capital M times f of x, where capital M is some large positive number. We'll go ahead and substitute in the Taylor expansion of our function f of x, and at this point I'm going to make two assumptions. The first is that the global maximum x0 lies between the limits of integration a and b, and that it's not an endpoint of the integration. The second assumption is that most of the contribution to this integral is found in the neighborhood of x0. This might make you curious, why am I making the second assumption? Well, it's because the second assumption is justified. Let me explain this on the side. Say I have a function g of x with a global maximum at xg that looks like this, with the single peak in the middle and a bunch of waves on the side. Suppose I take the exponential of this g of x multiplied by some positive number capital M. If our capital M is 1, our exponential function might look like this. It's still peaking at the global maximum of g of x, but not significantly peaking compared to the rest of the plot. However, if our capital M is large, like 100 for instance, then our exponential would have a very significant peak at the global maximum of g of x, and compared to this peak it would be relatively flat everywhere else. Now if I were to integrate this exponential for capital M equals 100, then most of the contribution to my integral would be in the neighborhood of this significant peak in the neighborhood of the global maximum xg. That's because the function is relatively flat everywhere else, meaning that this large peak is going to be the major contributor to the integral. Now if we go back to our integral involving f of x, this explanation I just gave should tell you why I made the second assumption. If capital M is sufficiently large, then this assumption will be quite justified. Now since most of the contribution to this integral is in the neighborhood of x0 for large capital M, what I can do is only consider the behavior of the function f of x in the nearby vicinity of x0, because that's all I need to do to approximate this integral with good accuracy. If I do this, then I can ignore all higher order terms and only consider f of x until the quadratic term in the Taylor expansion. Now let's simplify the terms being exponentiated and take out the constant exponential from the integral. At this point, I'm going to make another approximation. As capital M gets very large, this exponential is going to decay rapidly as we move away from x0. So even if we made our limits of integration go from negative infinity to infinity, instead of from a to b, it wouldn't really make a difference since the function being integrated is virtually zero as soon as we slightly move away from x0 anyway. Therefore, what we can do is change the limits of integration from negative infinity to infinity. When we do that, our integral just becomes a Gaussian integral of the exponential of negative something squared. You probably know how to compute this integral from your calculus courses when the limits are negative infinity and infinity, so I won't do the full calculation here. In any case, here is your final answer. So in the end, the integral from a to b of the exponential of capital M times a function with a unique global maximum at x0 is approximately equal to the square root of 2 pi over m times the absolute value of f double prime at x0 times the exponential of capital M times f of x0. Keep in mind that this approximation and the assumptions we use to reach this approximation are contingent on a large capital M. In particular, this approximation gets even better as capital M approaches infinity. Now the technique we use to arrive at this approximation to the exponential integral is called Laplace's method. 
And we're going to take Laplace's method and we're going to apply it to deriving the Stirling formula. To do that, we'll start with the definition of the gamma function. If you recall my video on the gamma function, links in the description, then the gamma function gamma of z is defined as the integral from zero to infinity of the exponential of negative t times t to the power z minus one dt. You may also recall from my video on the gamma function that the factorial of a positive integer n can be written as gamma of n plus one. This means that we can actually express n factorial as an integral using the definition of the gamma function. If we do that, we'll find that capital N factorial is the integral from zero to infinity of the exponential of negative t times t to the power capital N. Using a property of natural logs that the exponential of ln x is just x, we can put the t to the power n in the integral inside the exponential. And once we do that, we can move on to making a variable substitution where we'll let t equal capital N times s. In that case, dt is just n ds, and in addition, the limits of zero and infinity in the integral stay the same because capital N is just a positive number. Therefore, s is zero when t is zero, and s approaches infinity when t approaches infinity. The natural log of the product of two numbers is the sum of their natural logs, so we'll split up the ln of ns in the exponential. Then we'll take away the exponential of n times ln n and write that as n to the power n instead. We'll take the n common in the exponential term, and we'll take the n to the power n times n term outside the integral, since that's just a constant. I'm gonna label this equation as one, and I'll also label the simplified integral as i. Now this function that's multiplying the capital N in the exponential, this negative s plus ln s that I'll call h of s, this function actually has a global maximum at s equals one. This is what the plot looks like. You can see that h of s has a unique global maximum at s equals one, and the value of the function h of s at this global maximum is negative one. And since negative s plus ln s turns out to have a unique global maximum, this function that we're integrating looks very similar to what we were approximating in Laplace's method above. The only thing missing is the knowledge that the capital N, which is analogous to the capital M in Laplace's method, is a large number. So if we tack on the assumption that capital N is a large number, then we can apply Laplace's method to the integral i and obtain the following. We know that h of one is negative one, and we can easily take the second derivative of h and find its value at one, which will just turn out to be negative one. If we substitute this in the expression for the integral i, we'll find that i is approximately equal to the square root of two pi over n times the exponential of negative n. Now we'll go back and plug this into equation one for our factorial, and when we do that, here's what we'll get. The capital N in the square root is just n to the power of negative one half, so if we take this n to the negative one half and combine it with the n to the power of capital N plus one, here's what we'll get. And finally, if we want to get the Stirling formula, we'll have to take the natural logarithm of this expression. Because capital N is a very large number, we can ignore the natural log of the square root of two pi, and we can ignore the one half that gets added to the capital N here. And when we ignore these terms, we'll find that the natural log of N factorial is approximately equal to N times ln N minus N, or large N, which is exactly Stirling's formula for the natural log of N factorial. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.